Hey everyone, and welcome back to my Making a Game in the Desmos Graph and Calculator series. Last time we covered my basic goals for the project, as well as available inputs for the player to use. In this episode, I'll cover collision detection and basic physics implementation. One of the most important parts of my game will be the physics that control the movement of the player. My first step will be making a time variable. Last episode, I said that the play indefinitely slider would be appropriate for this. Here, I made slider t for just that purpose. You'll see that I set it equal to zero. That's because I want my time to start at zero seconds and increase from there. The step I want to set equal to the amount I want t to change per second. Since I want t to measure time accurately, I'll have it change once per second. So now I'm going to try running it. All right, it seems to be working the way I programmed it, but this isn't quite what I'd like. The issue is that while it does measure time accurately, it does have a catch. I'll set up a quick example with a moving circle here to show what I mean. As you can see, the circle moves, but it's very jumpy. That's because the time variable jumps by one every second. That means our frame rate is going to be one frame per second, since our enemies in scene would only be able to update once per second. This is a problem. To increase the frame rate, I need to find some way to speed up the rate at which t is incrementing. Fortunately, in the animation settings, there's a feature to increase the speed. I'm going to go ahead and put it at the maximum of 20 times. All right, let's set t back to zero and see what happens. That's closer to what I want, but now we have a new problem. While the frame rate has increased by 20 times to 20 frames per second, which is playable, the time variable no longer represents time in a realistic way. The solution for this is to change the step to 1 20th of its previous value. That way we achieve a higher frame rate while also maintaining a realistic time. Alright, let's give this a go now. Awesome, that's much better. I'll run a quick side by side of the old circle and the new one so that you can see the difference. Okay, now that we have our time variable set up, I think it's time to create our player. Later on, I plan on texturing the player and enemies, but for now, circles are easy and show what I need them to. So I type in the equation for a circle, and there he is. I'll set his size to have a radius of 2 for now. It doesn't really matter though, because as I zoom in and out of the graphing window, you see its size changes anyways. I'm keeping the size as a separate variable though for use in collision and for the other enemies to base their sizes off of. Alright, now that we have a circle that represents our player, where do we go from here? My overall plan for the player will be for him to stay relatively still and for the enemies to move at him. This will give the illusion that the player is moving forwards, and really, everything is just moving backwards. I need to do this because the human's camera or view of the player is locked unless they actually grab the graph and drag it. Since this isn't a playable option, I'll have to make the enemies in scene move backwards instead. The first thing I want to do is mess with the player's movement. All of the player's actions will be independent of time, so there isn't any need to implement that. I think the first thing I'll introduce will be a jump command. The first step here is creating a J slider for jump. I want to use a play once slider since I'll only want to jump once I've clicked the jump button. It might seem a little unintuitive, but I want the jump slider to run from some constant negative J1 to J1. J1 here will be the square root of the maximum height the player can jump. I'll just set it equal to the square root of 8 for now, so that the player will jump 8 units. If I play the slider now, you'll see that it slowly moves from negative root 8 to root 8. Just for fun, I'm going to hook up the variable that controls the height of the player. And now I'll hit play. Yeah, I don't know what I was expecting either. This is far from a jump. What I'll do is make a new variable, g, and set it equal to j squared. This should make the player jump on a parabola instead of a line. Now let's change the height variable of the player to g and see what happens. That's closer to what I want. Let's invert the direction and see what happens. Let's add an offset to make the player start at zero and increase from there. To do that, we'll need to add the heights constant, j1, squared, to the g definition here. Let's give that a go. That's almost what I'm looking for. I'm going to increase the animation speed of J to make the jump a little faster. And now we'll try that. And it's much better. In addition to the jump, I also want to add a lunge command. It'll be largely similar to the jump command I have, just controlling the x-axis instead of the y. I'll show a quick time lapse of me putting that in over this narration. That's really all the player movement controls I wanted to implement. Eventually, I plan to add a shoot command, but I'll save that for a later video. Now that we have all the players positioning down, we can create our first enemy. He'll just be a circle that moves towards the player. So here I'm going to hook up his X position so that he starts at 10. It moves negative 1 units per second. Let's try it now. Alright, that seems to be working. I'm going to make his size half of the players and move him to be on the same ground as the player. Finally, it's time to implement a collision detection between them. Collision will be defined as the player circle either touching or eclipsing the enemy circle in any way. Here I'll show a few examples of circles colliding, and here I'll show a few examples of circles not colliding. What I want to create is an equation to determine the distance between the circles, and return a positive number if there isn't a collision, and a negative number or zero if there is. 
The formula I'm going to base my collision off of is the distance formula. Here, the distance d will be the distance between the circles. x2 is the enemy's x location. x1 will be the player's x location. y2 is the enemy's y location. And finally, y1 is the player's y location. An important thing to note is that when I talk about circles' locations, I'm talking about their centers. This will be important later. Now that we know what the variables mean, how can we mathematically solve for the circle's positions? Starting with just the player, we already defined two variables to use for x1 and y1. u, the lunge amount, and g, the jump amount, are the only two variables that change the player's x and y positions respectively. We can sub those in directly to the equation above. Now let's look at the enemy's position. His x position is defined as negative 10 plus 10t. So we can plug that right in there for x2. His y position isn't going to change yet, so we can just plug in negative z over 2, which was the constant that makes him sit level with the player. This makes our final distance equation d equals the square root of negative 10 plus 10t minus u squared plus negative z over 2 minus g squared. It sounds like a lot, and it is, but it should work. The final thing we need to mess with is making the equation equal to 0 or less when the circles are touching or intersecting. This is probably the easiest part of the entire equation, because we see here, the distance between the centers of the circles must be z plus z over 2 when they are touching, less when they are intersecting, and greater when there is no collision. All we need to do is subtract this from our equation to get our final collision equation. So back in Desmos, I'll plug that equation in and run a quick inequality that fills the screen with red if there's an intersection. I'll change the time slider to a movable one so that we can control the enemy's location more precisely. That's a little loud. Doesn't seem to be working. Did I copy it right? Ah, uh, my bad. I flipped the u and g variables. Let's flip those and see what it looks like. Well, it certainly seems to be detecting collisions properly. A big downside with this method that I just showed is that for every enemy I create in the game, I will need its own collision equation. The equations are going to be very similar to each other, which makes it less of a bear to program. But I'm still going to have to write 40, 50, or even maybe 60 equations manually. Now that we have the basics of our physics created, we can focus on making more enemies and obstacles for our player to encounter. Before I do that, though, I want to discuss another important component of our game, storing data. Thanks for watching. Make sure to tune in next time for data storage and making a defeat screen. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask below. Until next time.